If you have your Bibles today, we are in Genesis, and we'll start in Genesis 12. And for those of you who are visiting or late people who don't get here every week, we are doing this summer a sermon series that is, is based on, that is inspired by, uh, the book by D.A. Carson, The God Who Is There. Uh, he is, I'm not doing, I, I don't preach people's books, we preach the Word of God, but his book has a wonderful way of breaking down the Word of God to show the, the story of the Bible from beginning to end. So we'll be going through basically Genesis through Revelation during the summer months here, and I want to give credit to D.A. Carson in that book because that is the, the clear inspiration and guide for me on this, and if you have that book or like to pick it up, you could read ahead week by week and be be ready uh, for these messages. He does a much better job than I ever would of, of going through these things. But uh, that is, is what we're doing. So we've been going through, starting with Genesis 1, the God who created everything, the God who is, in the beginning, God. What was there before creation? God. That's it. Well, who, who started him? No, he's God. He was there, eternal, no beginning, no end, created everything that's not him. Just think of it in those terms. He created everything that's not him. Everything else is a creation. He is God. If you don't understand that, the rest of the Bible will not make sense. And his creation was good. He created mankind in his image of everything else he created in the universe. Mankind created in his image, male and female, and that was very good the crowning glory of his creation. Place them in the garden, to enjoy the garden, to rule over it, to take care of it, and to have fellowship with him. He made us to have fellowship with him. Out of everything in creation, we should stand in awe of that truth. That was Genesis 1 and 2. That was the first message, the God who made everything. And then we got to Genesis 3. And then we have the rebellion. Mankind rebelled, de-godded God, decided that they would rather make their own decisions and make their own calls, even though they were warned that that would bring death. Yet they did. And so the product there was shame, guilt, broken relationship, away from God's presence, away from that relationship he created us to have, set into a cursed, dying, and hostile world, estranged and dying. And by the way, that has been and is the human race ever since, with regard to God. Estranged and dying in a hostile world. We should not be surprised that there are hurricanes and there are tornadoes and there are floods and there are droughts and there are diseases. That's the world we live in. We are estranged from God, and we are dying. The older we are, the more we feel that, don't we? Some of you young people say, oh, what's all that about? Don't worry, you'll see later. You'll find out. <laughs> so that's where we left after Genesis 3. That was last week's message. So now the question I want to ask is, how do we as humans, how does the human race describe their relationship to this God? Well, here's some, some ways that we do. First one is the super soft grandfather. You know, the guy with the long white beard. The benevolent gentleman whose primary job is to be nice. He is good. His job is to forgive us. We don't have to worry about too much because he's good and he's forgiving and God is, a, by the way, the God of liberal theology. Non-judgmental, loving, always good, long white beard, gentleman, whose job is to forgive us. Forgive everybody. That's one view that humans have of God. By the way, does that match what we learned in Genesis 1, 2, and 3? No. Second one is deism. This is, yeah, this is where a scientist would naturally incline him or herself. Uh, God is spectacularly great. He made the universe, and that universe, universe reflects his immensity, his glory. He is incalculably huge. He is glorious. He is ultimately too big to concern himself with us. 
So he's got this universe going and he just kind of sits in the background and lets it go. And uh, he really doesn't have time to deal with the minutia of our little lives. He's just out there and he's great. And that's it, that's deism, basically. Now, by the way, the first one, the super soft grandfather, in that one, we humans are the center of the universe. God exists to bless us. In the second one, God doesn't even care about us. He's got more important things, like the entire universe, to be involved in. And by the way, you can combine those, and what we have today is what, uh, what our culture, the American culture, generally believes about God. And that has been called therapeutic moralistic deism, <laughs> which means God exists, that's the deism. He wants us to be nice to each other, that's the moralism. And he wants us to be happy and successful. That's the therapeutic part. See, that's what our, generally our nation, outside of what I would call the true church, believes. God exists, he wants us to be nice to each other, and he wants us to be happy and successful. Does that match the God we've seen in the first three chapters of Genesis? Who is self-existent from eternity, who made everything that's not him, who made humankind to have this wonderful relationship, and when they blew it, removed from his presence and cursed, in a sense. So that's, those are some ideas of how we view God. Here's one that's very common. Mutual backscratcher. Pagan societies have long believed in this kind of a God. Polytheism believes in this kind of a God. There are multiple gods. They all have their quirks. They all have their idiosyncrasies. They all have their needs. They all have their wants. In fact, they are usually very, very human, just on a large scale. And so what we do is we try to appease them with kind of a barter system, whereas if we're worried about the volcano god who has the power to throw hot rocks on us or wash us in molten magma, for some reason he likes virgins, so we offer him a virgin to appease the volcano god. That's pagan religion. Or, if we want to have a child, we do something that will be, get us on the good side of the fertility god. That's pagan worship. By the way, Christians very often fall into this barter system, uh, mutual backscratching god. I've heard many times as a pastor, people who attend church, and I go visit them and say, well, glad to have you attending. I go, yeah, I've been thinking, I've been struggling in my job and this, and I figured if I started going to church, God would be happier with me and these things would be going better. Does that match the God of Genesis 1, 2, and 3? Not at all. But that's how we tend to do things. We tend to think, well, if I start doing this for God, these other things, you know, if I start having devotions every day, right, things are going to get better in the marriage. Well, by the way, that could happen very easily because there's other things that would result in that. But it's not because God is suddenly more happy with you. You see, all these things presuppose that God has needs that he is lacking something that we can help fulfill and give him something he likes. Does the God of Genesis 1, 2, and 3 have any needs? He created everything out of nothing. Everything that exists was created by him, except him. If he doesn't like what he's got, he'll destroy it and create something else. He has no needs. Well, maybe you think God is lonely, right? He created humankind to have a relationship. Maybe there was some loneliness in God. Remember how God was presented in Genesis? Let us make man in our image. We know on the other side of the cross how that plays out, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have a God that in his oneness has fellowship. He has no fellowship needs. He didn't need us. He didn't create us out of need. He created us of, up, out of his attributes, one of which is love, a desire to share himself. He has no needs. The truth is, there's no way we will have a relationship with this God unless he wills it. That's the God who is there. We have nothing to offer him. We have nothing with which to barter. The only way we can have a relationship with him is if he wills it. So here's the good news. God wills it. He desires to have a relationship with us on his terms because he's God. 
That's not selfish, by the way. That's just God. That's the God who is. We have nothing to offer. We have nothing to add to him. But he desires a relationship on his terms. So what we see now as we go on in Genesis is this God who has been rejected, his creation in his own image, his image bearers have rebelled against him, de-godded him, saying we want to be our own gods, we want to decide what's right and what's wrong and what we should do. He begins this reaching out to us, and he reaches out to us beginning here in Genesis with things that we call covenants. Now, some, some interesting history there. We can go back to uh, treaties that were made all the way back to around 2000 BC, back when the only things we have there are things that were chiseled in stone or carved into clay. You know, cuneiform, Sumerian. We can study ancient civilizations, and there's quite a bit of ancient writings we can study. And one thing we see in these that we have to study is, is treaties and covenants that nations make with one another. And back in those days, 2000 BC, it wasn't about harmony and getting together like the United Nations. Those with power ruled, period. That's the way the world was. And so powerful nations would make treaties with weak nations, and they would be something like this. They would say, nation one would say to nation B, okay, here's the deal. If you recognize us as your master and cooperate in that way, and give us whatever the treaty said, whatever they had, maybe it was so much gold every year, maybe it's 25% of their crops, whatever that nation had to offer, you give us that and, and treat us as master, we will, number one, not wipe you out. That's pretty good. Number two, we'll keep other bully nations from coming in and wiping you out. And we'll let you live in kind of a semi-autonomy and live your life the way you always have. That was an, an ancient agreement, and these treaties have a name. They're called suzerain covenants. Suzerain treaties that were set up in that kind of way with powerful nations. And by the way, th there, was, there was nothing to debate in these things. It was take it or leave it. The powerful nation called the shots. Here it is. There's no negotiation. It's not collective bargaining. It's here it is. You do this, and we won't wipe you out or let anybody else wipe you out. And what people have discovered is these ancient suzerain treaties are worded exactly the same way that these covenants in Genesis are. Now, some more liberal uh, theologians will seize upon that and say, see there, that isn't really God didn't do these. They, it was just very human. It's the way people did human things. It wasn't God saying, here's what's going to happen. By the way, liberal theology, when it gets down to its uh, core, is basically human created and ultimately not divinely inspired. So they would say, yeah, this is just a human thing. That was just a treaty, and they put God's name in there. The problem is, most of these liberal theologians that believe that way believe that Moses did not write <laughs> the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, that it was written somewhere around, you know, 500-ish uh, uh, B.C. and even later than that. What they fail to see is this dates this all the way back to 2000 B.C., right? We believe Moses wrote this about somewhere around 600-ish, 1600-ish, I'm sorry, B.C., describing things that happened about 400 years earlier because he received that information from God. He spent over a month on Sinai. That's what we believe about this word of God. What this shows is what he was describing is exactly the way they worded treaties in the year 2000 BC. It really affirms the authenticity of the antiquity, the historicity of the scripture that we have. It also shows us another thing. God borrows human things to speak to us. And one of the things we've seen in the first two weeks is we have a God who speaks. A God who expresses himself to us. He speaks using terms we can understand. When God comes to mankind and says, okay, how am I going to communicate my terms for this relationship? Because he's God. He says, I'll use what's already there. A suzerain treaty is exactly what we're talking about. The powerful nation that says, okay, here's what you do, and I won't wipe you out. That kind of a, there, there's no, no bartering there. Because we have nothing to offer, nothing to barter with. So, this is what God does. This is what some of these covenants really are. Now, Genesis 12 is where we are today. In Genesis 3 through 12, uh, in those chapters, it's not a pretty picture. 
abominations upon abominations multiplied until God wipes out nearly all the planet. Is that genocide? No, he's God. He's God. If a human did that, that would be genocide because we have no right. God created everything. He owns everything. It's all on his terms. That's the God who was there. First thing we have to understand is the concept of God. He's not the white-haired nice guy or the God who just set this thing in motion and sits back and says, I'm going to let it spin. He is the creator and sustainer, of the alpha and the omega, the words he used, the beginning and the end, the one who started it on his terms, the one who will finish it on his terms, and everything in between will be on his terms. So he wipes out nearly the whole planet, saves a handful of people, and they aren't any better. As soon as Noah gets off the boat, he gets drunk and messes up, and there's all kinds of stuff after that. And then we get another rebellion, Babel, Genesis 11, where humankind gets together and says, let's build a a temple all the way to heaven. This is the the classic man-made religion. Let's reach heaven. Now, they were foolish in their humanity to think that if they went high enough, they could reach God, which was human foolishness. God isn't up there, by the way. If you think God's up there, what does China do? To them, God's down there, other side of the world. Okay, let's... uh, that was, it was kind of interesting when the first uh, Russian cosmonauts went into outer space, and they, of course, were very proud of their atheism. One of their, one of their mockings was that they went into outer space and didn't find God, like they were going to find him up there. Same kind of human foolishness. But at any rate, so right after this Tower of Babel, where God divides them by language, and by the way, that's when all of our tribalism, racism, et cetera, et cetera, began. Well, actually, it began in the Garden of Eden, but here it began again. That's where we find Abram. After that, the next thing we see is the lineage that brings us down to Abram. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, as we'll begin reading there. Beginning with verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to a land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, this is not a covenant. This is just a promise. It starts, God said to Abram. Remember, he's a God who speaks. And there's Abram. We know nothing else about him except his lineage in the previous chapter. Why did God choose Abram? That's what we humans like to know. Why did God choose Abram? Was he better looking? Was he smarter? Uh, Did he do better on his SAT? Uh, We're not given a reason. God chose him for the reason God does everything God does, because he does. He chose him because he chose him. We have sovereign God here. What was his reason? He chose him. For whatever reason, he picked Abram living in a land which basically is a rock today. And he said to him, Abram, I want you to leave, leave your family, leave your culture, come to this place I'm going to show you. Abram probably said something like, where? And God said, I'll let you know when you get there. Don't need to know that. Just go, and here's what's going to happen. You'll be blessed. You'll be the father of nations. Everyone who blesses you will be blessed. Everyone who curses you will be blessed. Through you, the whole world, every nation of people will be blessed. Now, by the way, there was no negotiation here. God didn't say, oh, how does this sound? By the way, also, there was no requirements here. God did not say, Abram, if you, you know, we think, we automatically think, if you follow me, if you come here. God didn't say that. This is God. He just said, Abram, go. Now, if you know God is speaking to you, and it's very clearly God, you know it's not psychosis or anything like that, you will tend to do what God says. Plus, well, look, God did not say, by the way, if you don't, I'll kill you. It wasn't a fear of the Lord thing like, okay, if you go here, I will not zap you. He just said, okay, Abram, here's your blessing. This, this was just uh, God speaking and saying, here's what I'm going to do for you. But you've got to leave. You've got to go. And so... Abram followed God in that way. And the amazing thing is that promise that in him, the whole world, every phase of humanity 
would be blessed, which was God's desire from the start. It was God's sovereign choice. He chose Abram because he chose Abram. No one else could say, wait a minute, I'm more worthy because we have nothing to offer God in a barter system. God chose who he chose. He will bless who he blesses. And he chose Abram, and Abram followed, and he went. Little sidetrack. He went as far as Haran with his dad, and then after his dad was gone, he okay, said, okay, I'm, I'm doing this now. But at any rate, that's the first instance of God reaching down. The God who is there reaching down because he does desire a relationship with this rebellious people. Then we go to Genesis 15. By the way, there's more to this promise, but it began with a promise. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward is very great. The Lord deals nothing but positively with Abram. Here's what you're going to be blessed. The whole world's going to be blessed. And he comes and says, don't worry, man, you're, you're, you're going you're, you're to be good. Abram says, O Lord God, what will you give me since I'm childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, who wasn't even a blood relative, really, just lived in his house, or from his house. Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body shall be your heir. And he took him outside and looked to the heavens. He says, look to the heavens, count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And here's a magnificent verse in Genesis 15, 6. Then he believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. The Lord so far has had no demands on Abram, just promises. And he believed the promise of God. And this says that, when he believed God, God reckoned that to him as righteousness. By the way, that is salvation by grace through faith. That's what Paul seizes on in the New Testament as a key verse saying, you know, even before this law thing, there was salvation by grace through faith. As we go through here, you're going to be amazed how similar the Old and the New Testament are in how God works. Many people have the idea that they're two just dramatically different things, and the Old Testament is all that bloody mess and genocide and an angry God and all those laws and all those rules, and then you get to the grace of the New Testament. That shows that you have not been studying this book very carefully. God begins with grace. That promise he made to Abram was graceful. It was in spite of him, it wasn't because of him. And now, as he believed him, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. God saw him as righteous through faith. Isn't that not exactly how we stand in Christ Jesus? It began all the way back there. But then we go on from there. Verse 7, he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? Now, Abraham is a human being, and he's got his flaws like all of us. He believes God, but then he says, okay, how can I be sure? It kind of reminds me of the New Testament, the, was it the centurion that said, I believe, Lord, now help my unbelief. He believed, it was reckoned him as righteousness, then he turns around and says, okay, how can I know this is really going to happen? God, understanding, humankind with compassion, says, okay, here's what we're going to do. He says in verse 9, so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, a young pigeon. And he brought these to him, and they cut them in two, and laid each half opposite the other, did not cut the birds. And birds of prey came down to the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Take these animals, cut them in two, a bloody mess, separate them, and that rotting flesh, there's vultures coming down and crows and all that. He's chasing them away. Here's what you need to know. Another thing that was one of the customs of the times was the strongest promise you could make between two people was a covenant that would be cut, and you would take an animal, you would kill it, you would, you would saw it in two, separate the halves, and the two parties would walk between the animals saying, if I fail to agree to my part in this, may what happened to this animal happen to me. It was a, a promise that said, willingly, I will die. I will be slaughtered. I will be killed if I don't keep this. That was the strongest human promise of the day you could have. This is what God does. Again, he uses what's already there to communicate his commitment. 
And by the way, God does this down through the ages, takes things that are part of the human culture to help us understand. When, when Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, boy, people in that culture, they knew exactly all that that meant. When he said, I am the living water, you drink from me, you'll never thirst again, people living in a semi-arid land that depended on the early and latter rains knew exactly the power and the glory of what that means, using things as part of their culture. So these animals are halved. Now, this is interesting. Here's what happens. Verse 12. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness, literally a dark terror, a terrifying darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs. They will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years that I will judge the nations whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you'll go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, they'll return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. He gives them a brief history of what's going to happen. And by the way, the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. You know, we talk about the God of the Old Testament as being a genocidal God. What he's saying here is they haven't gotten to that point yet where they really deserve that, but they're going to. So we're going to wait until then. In other words, if there was some kind of an honest court of law, God would not be accused of genocide. They'd be getting exactly what they deserved. And he's going to wait until that time was right. That's just a little passing thing there. But we'll go on here. And it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch. That's the presence of God there passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Camonite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the... Re I should have had a lay reader read this one, shouldn't I? Oh, well. <laughs> the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Gergesite, and the Jebusite, all those people, their land is going to be yours. Okay, if it was a Sunday school class, I would ask you, tell me what's interesting about what just happened. Did Abram walk between those animals? You see, you cut a covenant. It was between two parties. They had agreement. I will do this if you do this. They walked together that said, if I don't keep my part, may what happened to this animal happen to me. In this one, God's the only one that passed through the bloody aisle. Abram didn't. Abram did not pass through to say, if I don't do this, may this happen to me. And by the way, if he did, if you study the history of Abram's family and Israel, they would have been disqualified a hundred times over, if not a thousand. He didn't walk through that. This was a one-sided covenant. God does his own covenant with himself. By the way, the words are echoed in the book of Hebrews. I have sworn by myself, says the Lord. This is God taking full responsibility for this happening not based on whether they are worthy or whether they're good enough. This, by the way, friends, is nothing less than grace. You see that connection? Grace did not start in the New Testament. Grace started with the very moment God began dealing with his people. They cut the covenant. God goes down the bloody aisle all by himself. He takes full responsibility for its fulfillment. Abel sin. Isaac will be a wimp. Jacob will be a deceiving uh, trickster. Jacob's sons will basically sell one of the sons to slavery in Egypt. And by the way, these are the patriarchs. What a disgusting history. But the covenant was one-sided with God. Abe did not walk through between those halves of the animals. God made the covenant with himself. And in spite of who they were, he is the God of grace. I wonder how many of you have never noticed that before as you look through this passage. God's the only one that went through. Abram didn't. Well, we aren't finished there. There's more to come. Let's flip over to Genesis 17. Should be the very next page if you're there. And Genesis 17. Abram was 99 years old. He appeared to him and said, I am the Lord God Almighty. Walk with me and be blameless. I will establish a covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, But as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. 
and you'll be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer will you be called Abram, but Abraham, for I will make you a father of a multitude. You'll be exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. I will give to you and descendants after you the land of your sojournings, the land of Canaan, everlasting possession. And God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant. Now so far there's been no stipulations on Abram's side. Here we go. Now there's going to be some stipulations. Verse 10. This is my covenant. I'll keep between me and you and your descendants. Every male among you should be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, the sign of the covenant between me and you. Every male among you, eight days old, shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in a house, who is brought with money and from a foreigner, uh, who is not your descendant, it goes on to describe those things. Okay, why circumcision? Here's what you need to know. That wasn't something new. God didn't just create this thing. That was something that was being done in some of these ancient cultures. That was not foreign. He took something that was already there and said, okay, here's what your part's going to be. And something that seems so bizarre, yet when you think about it, as our responsibility, it's something very easy to do. That's done once and you're finished. It's not like a burden of ongoing having to maintain your faithfulness. It has to do with the shedding of blood, which as we know down the line is going to make all kinds of sense. We haven't even got to the sacrificial system yet, which will culminate in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the removal of flesh, which has all kinds of New Testament implications. And it's something that they can do quite easily. He's not asking much, but something that will mark them as his people. Grace abounds even here as well as a foreshadowing. But here's where it gets interesting. Let's move on from there and let's go to Genesis 22. By the way, the miracle child is born. He was an old man beyond the years of childbearing. He had an old wife beyond the years of childbearing who, by the way, had been barren all of her life. Flat out miracle. He gets the child. And there's many more things we could talk about in between there, but uh, just know that. He, he gets the, the, the miracle child, which is the child of the promise. That's going to be the key to all those nations being blessed and him being a multitude of many nations and descendants like the stars in heaven and like the sands on the seashore. There's that child. Are you ready for Genesis 22? Then it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. And after you keep that in mind, this is a test. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, now take your son, your only son. By the way, that's a term that is very similar to the New Testament. You know that we say only begotten son. That begotten shouldn't really be in there. That's a, an ancient translation that we're stuck with. It really says your, your only and unique son. It's the exact same wording as here, by the way, that's talked about in Jesus Christ. Now take your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. What? Yeah, okay, you've got the son, now take him and offer him as a burnt offering. By the way, we're shocked by this. Again, this is something that was not uncommon in the ancient cultures of this time. The worshipers of Molech would sacrifice their children to Molech. This is, it's one of the things that the Israelites struggled with with other nations. They're, they're, this was not that uncommon, not as shocking as it is today. It was something that the pagans were doing to some extent. So Abram rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey. That's one time I'm glad I don't have the King James. Took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split wood for a burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abram raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abram said to the young man, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. And Abram took wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and took his, in his hand the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked together. And Isaac spoke to Abram, his father, and said, my father. He said, here I am, son. And he said, Behold, the fire in the wood, but where's the lamb for the offering? Abram cleared his throat. No, I added that from the margin. He said, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. 
And they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. By the way, he was probably around 13 years old. That's most likely about his age. Uh, and he stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abram raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abram went took the ram and offered him up as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abram called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh, by the way. And it said on this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. And the angel called a second time to Abraham and said, I, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heavens, as a sand on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of your enemies. So what do we make of this story? Number one, do we have a God who would ask someone to sacrifice their child? No, the point of the story is the opposite. God did not want that. He didn't let him do that. That was not what God desired. What he wanted, he was asking Abram, do you believe in me like the pagans do their deities? Are you willing to go to the extent that some of them do? He did not want to sacrifice his child. He was testing the faith of Abraham. And by the way, God is God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows all. He knew Abram. This was for Abraham's benefit. By the way, in Isaac's too, some of our modern people think, oh, this is child abuse. Think of the emotional scars that child would bear the rest of his life from having his father take him and about ready to kill him. Well, from our, <laughs> our modern therapeutic age, that's the way we think. But think of Isaac who saw the faith of his father in a God who did not want him killed, but did provide the sacrifice just as he said, and so an example of what real faith is. Do you believe God? See, faith is more than believing in God. Faith is believing God. You say, well, if God asked you to go sacrifice your son, would you do it? Number one, God wouldn't do that. That's pretty well established here, isn't it? But if he asked me to do some pretty strange things, he would have a reason for it, beyond what I could say. Secondly, God provides the sacrifice. Go back to that covenant. It was God who walked all by himself between those pieces of animal, saying, it's all on me to see that this gets done. All those promises were all based on God, not on human performance. The only thing they were asked to do at this point was circumcision, which wasn't much. I mean, you know, you'd think it's, that's a weird thing, but uh, it really wasn't much. And it was something that was, again, not uncommon in the culture there. But here we see God providing the sacrifice, which we know on the other side of the cross, ultimately fulfilled in his son. He provided the sacrifice. He provides the sacrifice for all of our sins. He is the one that takes responsibility. It's grace. The God of the Old Testament is the God of grace with salvation through faith. He is a good God. He is a God who is reaching down to rebellious people on his terms because he's God and we have nothing to barter with. Saying, yes, this will be on me. All I ask of you is to believe me. All I ask of you is to believe me. Do you really believe me? God found out here. He already knew. Abraham confirmed here. He really did believe as did his son Isaac, confirmed that yes, he really did believe. As we see God, the God who writes his own agreements, he's a God that meets people on his terms, but in ways that we are able to handle. He's a God who understands human weakness and responds to us accordingly. He is the God of grace, Yet, he's not the white-haired old man that just, just, his job is to forgive our sins. No. He is God. He's the owner of everything. We have nothing to barter with him. He needs nothing from us. This is purely his.
his love reaching down in a way that does not compromise his holiness, does not compromise his righteousness, and yet expresses his love. It may seem strange to us because these are different cultural times. But when you really understand who this God is and what he's doing, only then does the rest of the Bible begin to make sense. Only then are we ready for the laws, the sacrifice system. And it all makes sense as one God doing one thing from beginning to end. We don't make a major wall between the Old and New Testament. It's the same God, the same purpose. He's doing it differently in different times as he reaches down to his rebellious image bearers to bring them back into his presence without sacrificing his holiness, righteousness, without de-godding himself like humans do at every turn. He is God. Thanks be to God that he is a good God and is a God of love who did make us in his image and we are still the crowning glory of his creation. And he has reached down to us ultimately in Christ Jesus, the fulfillment of all of this. The one slain, the one taking our place, the sacrifice that God provided, all that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we who sit on the other side of the cross can look back on this and rejoice and give thanks. He's not the, the weird, angry God of bloodshed and genocide of the Old Testament. He's a God of grace that, because he is God, calls sin, sin, and yet finds a way to reach down to us rebels. Let's pray.